Welcome back to the Drunk on Riding Stephen King Dies Section series, brought to you in part through the patronage of Aria North, and the final, at least for now, dissection addendum focusing on Carrie. Today we're going to take a look at Carrie the Musical, which originally premiered in 1988 and has made some random appearances since. Before we get started though, remember that you can get more videos more often, including the patron exclusive behind the scenes and Drunk on Riding video club just by going to drunkonwriting.com and signing up. Now, from the outside, Carrie doesn't seem like the right material for a musical adaptation, does it? Though, since we mentioned it last time, neither does the Evil Dead, and they did one for that as well. All the men in my life keep getting killed by Kandarian demons. All the men in your life keep getting killed by Kandarian demons. First there was Ed. But unlike The Walking Dead, which has had pretty much non-stop production since its 2003 premiere, Carrie the Musical has not had such luck, which is pretty unfortunate given the 2012 cast soundtrack recording, which you can buy or get from your local library like I did, which is, I gotta say, pretty amazing. I've had it on repeat on my iPod, yes, I still have an iPod, for what seems to be months now. I feel like I've been prepping for this one forever. And it, I really want to see this musical on, on stage. I really do. Because the, the songs create a dip, different atmosphere compared to the movies and the television adaptation that we've talked about previously. It's, especially with, with Chris Harkinson and, and Margaret White, these characters are seemingly for the first time truly sympathetic. You know, maybe that's that's the, the the power of the stage, the power of song. But I said last time that Tommy finally was served. It was well served. I could finally relate to what everybody else saw in them. I can finally relate to these characters on a different level. Thanks to Carrie the Musical, I, I never cared about any of them. I thought they just sucked. You know, Margaret and Chris, they're just horrible people. But in here... You, they're, they're more rounded. They're more well off. They're, like I said, they're sympathetic. You 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 look you listen to uh, the world according to Chris, or uh, when there's no one, or even do me a favor, which draws a, a a unique parallel between Sue and Chris's situation that is sort of there in the original material. It's sort of there in the other adaptations, but not presented in this way. Not presented in a way that you really see how similar the scenarios are and how just these small decisions can lead to drastically different outcomes. It's, it's fascinating. Side note, real quick, I could watch a recording of the 2012 uh, performance, the same one that produced the soundtrack through the Lincoln Center Library for the Performing Arts, but... I would have to stay in the library. Now, you can take it out if you have the proper research uh, credentials. I don't think that I do, even if I showed them this YouTube series and said, hey, look, I'm doing videos on all of the adaptations. I don't think they would let me do it. So I didn't, I didn't go there, just so we're on the same page. However, the internet is fabulous. And the internet has some long, long, rather long, uh, videos on the musical, on separate, several different versions of the musical that I was able to browse and watch and check out. So just so we're all on the same page, but let's take a step back a second to the why of Carrie the musical. In an interview, the musical's librettist, wait for it, Lawrence D. Cohen, Yes, that Lawrence D. Cohen. I told you he would be back, didn't I? Did I mention that in a previous episode? Maybe I didn't and I just thought it, but I think I did. But this isn't even the last time he'll be mentioned. He's going to come up repeatedly throughout this series, at least for a while. And he, of course, was the, the, the playwright, the not playwright, screen 
writer behind the original Carrie adaptation, as well as the 2013 adaptation for, I don't know, reasons. Yes, it's all rather bizarre and amazing, but in an interview that Cohen did with uh, author and editor Brian James Freeman when promoting his tell-all book, What Were They Thinking? Carrie, from book to movie to musical, which I unfortunately cannot find a copy of. I couldn't find it on eBay, Amazon, library, anywhere. So if you have a copy of it, please forward it my way. I would love to read it. But anyways, Cohen says, Composer Michael Gore and I went to the Metropolitan Opera in New York one night to see a very unusual and out-of-the-box opera by Alban Berg entitled Lulu, the story of an amoral temptress who sleeps with a variety of lovers and betrays everyone, only to end up a prostitute who has a fatal encounter with Jack the Ripper. It was an unusual, very arresting piece to say the least. Unconventional when it was written back in the 1930s and still unconventional a half century later, even by opera standards. Michael and I were walking down the steps of Lincoln Center when he turned to me and said, you know, if Alban Berg were alive, he would be writing a musical of Carrie. There was a long silence. It was one of those light bulb going off aha moments in the air. And we were up until dawn brainstorming about its possibilities. Yes, I could have trunketed that quote a bit, but that Lulu, doesn't that sound really cool? Like, I, I want to see that. Uh, but I still want to see Carrie. So let's, let's get back to Carrie. So Cohen and Gore, who composed the 1980 musical drama Fame, for which he won two Academy Awards, Best Original Score and Best Original Song, started work on this stage production. An important note, because neither of them, nor Gore's famed collaborator Dean Pitchford, who they brought on as a lyricist to help with rewrites, had ever done a Broadway musical before. Not a deal breaker, not necessarily a bad thing, so it's nice to bring in new blood, but perhaps the root of the problem? Maybe? The musical had its first workshop in New York in August 1984, but it took a few years to sort of raise the funds, raise the cash needed to put on such a large production. And it wasn't until 1988 that it officially hit the stage with producer Frederick Kurtz and the Royal Shakespeare Company behind the curtain. Its four weeks somewhat hotly contested run began February 13th in Stratford-upon-Avon, England, where it got mixed reviews and, I mean, knowing only the book and the movie, could you blame them? The production included pyrotechnics, okay, that I get, you know, fire being important to the story, lasers, but why were there lasers? A flying staircase, what? And skin-tight suits. Look, I'm certainly not a big Broadway guy, but I, I mean, I guess it must take a special kind of someone nuts. Now, the musical was plagued with technical difficulties. They couldn't cover Lindsay Hately, who, in her stage of view, played Carrie, with blood without killing her, her microphone. There were rewrites after every single performance. Barbara Cook, an incredibly talented uh, industry veteran, resigned on opening night after she was nearly beheaded, decapitated. Like, this shouldn't be happening on a Broadway stage. But she did stay on for uh, the remainder of the England uh, production because they couldn't find a replacement in time. But and 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 they replaced a few songs. Which let's just get into it because there there were a number of replacements between the original England production and even just the 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 production on Broadway, which was the same year, not that long later. A number of songs got replaced, and they would continue to be replaced throughout the production's runs, you know, into 2012 and the other the other versions of Carrie the Musical that would appear. Which is kind of weird. You would think that it would stick through, but I guess a lot of it had to do with critic reaction, but we'll get to that in a second. So, between the, the run in Stratford-upon-Avon and the Broadway version, um, there were four songs that were excised from the original. So we had Her Mother Should Have Told Her, Cracker Jack, Dream On, AKA The Prom, and White Star with the run, the Broadway run substituting with different rewrites that incorporated some of the lyrics from those original songs 
or, well, Out for Blood, which was basically just, it was a song and dance number about slaughtering a pig. So, yes, Carrie the Musical came to Broadway, the Virginia Theater to be specific, the same year, 1988, at a cost of some $8 million. And then, after opening May 12th, closed after just 16 previews and five performances on May 15th, three whole days later. It's considered one of Broadway's biggest flops. But again, is that because of the talent involved? Terry Hands, the play's director and the artistic director for the Royal Shakespeare Company, offered this little bit. I didn't know what I was getting into. I don't know anything about the American musical. This is my first time. But all of us on the show have been incredibly, unbelievably inexperienced. Rarely have such inexperienced, but I suppose kind of naively enthusiastic people got together to try and make something work. It was like wrestling with a boa constrictor. It keeps coming, and you keep thinking you don't know where to put your feet. Interestingly, the theater was sold out for every single performance. It was sold out all three nights. And after every performance, after this general mix of boos and applause, maybe more boos than applause, stories are mixed. But Haley and Betty Buckley, who replaced Cook as Margaret White and also played Miss Collins in the original film, a.k.a. Miss Desjardins, they got standing ovations. Haley would even go on to win the 1988 Theater World Award for Best Broadway Debut. But my point being, it might be considered a flop, but it didn't close because it didn't make money. Hans actually points this out in a later interview where he said, the RSC has got its money back on the show, so financially we did not lose. In fact, we made almost a half million dollar profit. The problem, though, were the reviews. While Stephen King said that he liked it, and that's always well and good, especially, you know, coming off of, of stuff like uh, uh, The Shining, Kubrick's The Shining, where he just despised it and outright refused to support it. But when your New York Times review compares you to the Hindenburg disaster, calling you a typical musical theater botch, what do you expect? Though Cohen, interestingly, cast the blame in a different direction. As he claims, the show closed not as myth would have it because of reviews, we got enough good ones to run, but because the German producer who backed it ran out of money and fled the country in the middle of the night, closing the bank accounts without telling any of us. I believe that would be Kurtz he's referring to there, but I could be wrong. I, I couldn't find anything definitive in my research, but I, I, think, I think that's what he's referring to. But whatever the actual reasons for the closing, whether it's it was the scathing reviews, whether it truly did lose money, even, you know, the record seems to show that it did not, or, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever reason it was, soon after, bootleg footage and audio started making the rounds. You know, this is the time before the internet, but they're, they're, getting shared at conventions, getting shared on the black market of musicals. I don't know where the black musical market is, but I assume that it's somewhere in the Marriott. That's what I would guess. But soon after, soon after they started making the rounds, it started to develop this inevitable cult status, leading to, as Cohen put it, a zillion requests from high schools, colleges, and theater companies around the world to mount new productions of the show. That wouldn't happen for nearly two decades when, around 2009, Cohen, Gore, and Pitchford got together and revised the entire thing, including uh, cutting, rewriting, or replacing more than a third of the songs from the Broadway production, and, thankfully, ditching the unnecessary over-the-top 80s lasers, plastic skin-tight suits aesthetic and going with something a, a bit more realistic. As Cohen put it, we spent three years revisiting Carrie scene by scene, song by song, trying to rescue a show that hadn't met our dreams the first time. Having faced all the baggage and all the naysayers who said Carrie would never happen again on stage, and on a stage in New York, no less, 
we did what we wanted to do, fix the show. This new $1.5 million off-Broadway production produced by MCC Theater uh, opened March 1st, 2012 at the Lucille Lortel Theater and closed just a little over a month later after 34 previews and 46 performances. That was two weeks earlier than originally scheduled and unfortunately because of poor ticket sales and again terrible critical reviews, some of which call the thing dull and one note. Sadly, the production did not earn its money back, though the MCC directors did say afterwards, MCC, the authors, and the director achieve what we all set out to do, to rescue Carrie from oblivion and to give her new life. And it's true. This version earned 13 theater award nominations, won Best Revival by the Off-Broadway Alliance, and the cast recording I mentioned earlier hit 183 on Billboard's current albums chart when it released. Not, you know, it's not Beatles level, but it's something to be celebrated. And again, as I said earlier, it is fabulous. I love it. It's been on repeat on my iPod. I've been listening to it endlessly. Especially like, do me a favor and in. Oh my God, they're so, so good. I just, I honestly can't get it out of my head. Get, can't get in out of my head. Just, just listen to this little bit. I'm gonna give you an earworm. What can I possibly do to squeeze in? How? Why not now? When will I be long? Look where I am. Damn, damn. I hold my feet well. What if I do? Snap. Holy crap, I crawl out of my skin. And so will you. Now, I, lo I could say that I loved it, but there were some people, like theater writer and critic Peter Felicia, who said he believed that Carrie was fundamentally unworkable. I see no reason to remount Carrie at all, he said. I have no advice on how to make it better. I can't think of a thing. Mind you, I don't hate it. I just don't think it's worth the effort. He wasn't alone in that sentiment, but after the revival, the musical finally became a licensable performance, uh, a licensable property for high schools and colleges, and a number of stage productions have gone up since the 2012 revival. I mean, you can go on YouTube and watch clips from so many different versions, and they all sort of bring their own lovely little flair to the production. And interestingly, there's also been a few spoofs, like Scary the Musical and Carrie's Facts of Life. There's also been a Riverdale episode, Chapter 31, A Night to Remember, which truly goes out of its way to demonstrate just how closely the musical's plot mirrors its own. And it's, it's horrible. It's just so, it's so bad. <laughs> but it did have its own album release and introduced Carrie the Musical to a whole new generation and I kind of liked it. It kind of got me interested in watching Riverdale despite the fact that they're that oh they're just like <laughs> the characters would just say you know it is just like in the carry the musical that we're putting on. Like, come on people don't talk that way just mirroring it. Oh, it's so bad. Um, oh that Riverdale by the way as I noted in last episode was uh, developed by uh, what's his name Roberto Aguirre Sacasa. Uh, who co-wrote the 2013 Carrie adaptation. I mean, these people, Cohen, Sakasa, Aguirre Sakasa, they just don't seem able to leave Carrie alone, do they? They just, they just want to keep revisiting it, trying to make it better, trying to make it work. But you know what? I think I'm going to leave Carrie alone for a while, though I'm going to end this episode by saying... Suggesting, why not a carry the musical film adaptation? Huh? Huh? Just throwing, just throwing that one out there because, uh, I mean, musical adaptations, they've been doing okay. Not the Cats one. That one doesn't seem to be doing okay, but, you know, it looked pretty good on Riverdale. The musical numbers and the choreography. 
and I think it would look good as a film, as something a little bit different than, you know, the continuous regurgitation of the Lawrence E. Cohen screenplay. Like, come on. Let's, let, let, we, we can leave Brian De Palma's version alone. Like, it was great. Let's move on. Let's get a musical on the screen. Just, you know, skip the lasers. We don't need lasers or skin tight suits. Yeah. This has been a drunk on a riding dissection addendum discussing Carrie the musical. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, please give the video a thumbs up. Please leave a comment below. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like more videos more often, head on over to drunkonriding.com and sign up. Uh, you also get a ton of exclusive content and rewards. There's some cool stuff over there. Go check it out. But anyways, until next time, cheers and keep on riding.